Hello, everyone. Welcome you again to worship today uh, from York ARP Church. Uh, I hope you are doing well. Just a few quick announcements as we go through this. Again, uh, there will be portions here where you will pray uh, together, where you will sing together. Uh, if you've watched the videos before, you understand how to do that. Um, also, please uh, send in your tithe via Box 475, York, South Carolina, 29745. Again, if you're attending a different church in a different state, please send in your tithes to your home church uh, to help them uh, in this time as well. Uh, just, again, a few quick uh, announcements. We still plan on starting worship back at 10 a.m. on Sunday, June the 7th. Uh, there will be guidelines uh, that will be uh, talked about and, and decided upon by the session between now and then, but we look forward to uh, Lord willing be able to worship together uh, in the sanctuary on that day. Uh, but until that, we'll continue on with our normal schedule. Um, after worship on, today on Sunday at 1130, uh, we will have a Zoom meeting uh, just to say hello, to pray together. Please, uh, I encourage you, if you haven't done that, uh, please you know, just join in on that. It's an, a, a way for us to see each other face to face. Uh, to say hello um, until we can actually see each other face to face in person again. Um, continuing to send out videos on Monday, devotions Monday through Friday. Um, I have been having a little technical difficulty um, messing around with that, so uh, just be aware of that if things change, but I'll be glad to let you know uh, if things do change. But uh, I'm glad that you could tune in today um, as we worship together. Uh, may not be in person, but in spirit. So may we now turn to worship the Lord as we hear our call to worship from Psalm 146, verses 1 and 2. Hear now God's word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before your throne today thanking you. Lord, just, just for who you are, for you're an amazing God, a gracious God, a merciful, a wonderful God, that we can come today and worship. Lord, may you open our hearts and our minds today as we are gathered together in spirit in our homes. Lord, may you draw us closer to you. May you help us to truly worship you, tune out all the distractions and Lord, focus upon you today. Lord, may you show us your glory. May you show us your majesty. Lord, may we honor you accordingly. Lord, as we sing together today, Lord, may you shine through to us. Lord, as we pray, may we be reminded that you are indeed our provider, our sustainer, our savior. Lord, may you just bless each one of these folks today listening and watching. May you work in them, work in their families, building us all up together for you and for your sake. For we come today, Lord, and we recognize that without you, we are in trouble. We are dead in our sins and our trespasses. We cannot do good. We cannot honor you as you deserve. And as sinners, we deserve the wrath. No matter how many good deeds, Lord, we have broken your commands. And we come before you recognizing this. But Lord, that we need you to save us. Lord, may you help each of us to put our trust in you as our God, as our Savior, as the only way that we can be forgiven. And Lord, if we have done this, may we continue to do that each and every day. Not only as the one who has redeemed our souls, but the one who continues to conform us to your image. Lord, help us each and every day to be sanctified, to be more and more like Jesus. Help us to turn away from our sin, to cast it off, to hate it, and Lord, to seek to follow him. Not as a burden, but Lord, as a, as a blessing. The joy. May we love your word. May we love your commands. And Lord, may we love doing them, thinking them, saying them in our lives. Father God, may you bless each one of us. Draw us nearer to you this day. Continue to be with our world and those that are sick. May you continue to provide healing. 
continue to provide guidance to the leadership. Lord, may you continue to, to heal the broken bonds between those of different opinions, those that have struggled, those that have had hardship that, and disagreement. Lord, may you be the God of reconciliation. May you bring us back together. Lord, may you reconcile your people that have been lost. May you use technology as we are using today. And Lord, and all the other means to reach the lost, so that they may be reconciled to you, putting their faith not no longer in themselves, but in Christ. Lord, may you continue to work through us in this time. Lord, may you continue to bless your church. Bless us here at York ARP. May we grow in spirit. May we grow in number. And Father God, we pray above all that you be blessed. And Lord, if we are struggling, wondering what to pray, May you remind us that we can always pray the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Now, this is the time uh, of, the, of the message. If you will pause the video, sing a couple songs together as a family, pray together, and then resume the video. Our scripture today comes from Philemon, verses 8 through 16. Again, that's, it's only one chapter, so Philemon, verses 8 through 16. Now, as you're turning there, if, you, if you're tuning in for the first time today, last week we started looking uh, at the book of Philemon. And if you were, li were listening last week, uh, we saw that this letter, it is written by the Apostle Paul uh, to a godly Christian man named Philemon, who was a leader in the Colossian church. Now, we have previously looked at who exactly this Philemon was that Paul was writing to. But as we continue on looking at this letter today, in our passage, now we see exactly why Paul is writing this letter to this man. Before we jump in and do that, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God, Lord, we come before you and we thank you for your word. Lord, it is a blessing to us, Lord, as you speak to us from it, as you show us who you are, what you have done, as you show us your truth and what you command us in our life, Lord, we thank you for the scriptures. Lord, today may you illuminate our hearts and minds to see your truth here. Lord, to take it and to live it, to love it, to cherish it. Lord, be with me. Lord, may I decrease that you may increase, that your people would see you Clearly, and honor you all the more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, uh, Philemon verses 8 through 16. Hear now God's word. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. Now there is a story told of a runaway slave. And this slave, he had, he had a good master, but for whatever reason, um, this slave ended up stealing from him and running away. 
And as he made his way out of town, the slave traveled and traveled until he finally made it to the big city. And as he tried to settle in, he tried to find work, the slave happened upon a preacher. And after listening to, to what this preacher man had to say, this slave realized that he needed Jesus. Because formerly this, this slave didn't know Christ. And it was from this preacher that he learned that he was a sinner in need of salvation. And so this particular slave ends up giving his heart to Christ. And after that, he, begun, he begins to help uh, this pastor uh, with, with ministry needs, with, with personal needs, uh, being there caring for him. But as time went on, the pastor told this slave that he needed to go back to his master and make things right. And it turned out that this pastor actually knew this slave's master. And while the slave knew that this was indeed the right thing to do, he was afraid. And so because of this, the pastor writes a letter to this slave's master explaining all that has happened with this slave in order that the master would welcome him back with open arms. Now, this is not just a random story, actually. This isn't even back in the slave times here in the United States. This is actually the story behind the letter of Philemon. A true story for us. Philemon, as we've been introduced to, he had a slave named Onesimus. And Onesimus stole from him and he fled to Rome, to the big city at the time. And when he was there, he happened upon Paul, who was under house arrest, And he came to faith. And so now we see Paul is writing this letter to Philemon to tell him all that has happened with Onesimus. To show him how God has brought him into the church of Christ. Not as a slave, but as a brother. So that Philemon and the church that Philemon was a part of would embrace Onesimus when he returned as a fellow believer. And it's this story that we find behind this letter that speaks to us, reminds us of the same things. For as we walk through this passage, it, it shows us how we're called to receive fellow believers, no matter who they are, no matter what they may have done in the past. You know, and I think there are times that when we come across people who say that they're Christians, who say that they've come to faith, we may be very hesitant to accept that person. And we may be very quick to, to jump and judge them. But yet our scripture this morning will show us just how we should view others in the church. Not looking at them in the light of, of what they have done in the past, but looking at them and how Jesus has worked in them. And as we see that, as we see that this is the way that we should look at fellow believers, as Christ has worked in them, uh, this passage shows us that it is evident in three ways. Uh, we see how Jesus works in believers at first, that Christ changes hearts. Then that he connects his church. And finally, that he controls all things. So we have three C's to help us remember. Changes, connects, and controls. And this will all show us how Jesus works in his church. Now, as we begin, the first thing that we see is why we should ex be accepting of fellow believers is because Christ changes hearts. Now, as Paul is writing here, he wants Philemon to see that Onesimus' heart, it has been changed by Jesus. In verses 8 and 9, Paul decides to take a loving approach instead of commanding Philemon. As you know, Paul, he was an apostle, and he could have commanded Philemon to accept Onesimus. But he realized that that's not the way to go with this. So he appeals to him as an elder, as a prisoner for Jesus. Appealing to him, as he says in verse 10, 
for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Now, we don't know the exact details of how Paul and Onesimus um, came together. But what we can see is by calling himself Onesimus' father, we can understand that Onesimus became a believer through Paul's ministry. And Paul wants to show Philemon that Onesimus has indeed changed. He's not the same man that he was before. And Paul illustrates this in verse 11. If you look at that, he says, Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Now, it's interesting that Paul actually uses a play on words here uh, because the name Onesimus means beneficial in Greek. And what Paul is saying here is before his conversion, this man who was named beneficial was actually useless. But now that his heart has been changed, he has been made useful. And Paul shows us that here and how he has been serving and helping him. Now, Philemon, as he is probably reading this, and he probably sees Onesimus kind of hanging around in the background, um, he is probably skeptical. You know, this, 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 this same slave that Paul is talking about is the same one who stole from him and ran away. But Paul writes here to show Philemon that as he sends Onesimus back to him, that his slave has changed. And he is useful to him. Just as he served Paul in Philemon's place, in verse, as he says in verse 14. He wants to show Philemon that this slave is different. He does have a worth, not of his own, but through Christ. Christ has made him useful by changing his heart. You know... This makes us remember that we often pass judgment on others. Sometimes intentional, sometimes not even realizing. And we, we look at them by what they've done in the past, the sins that they have committed, or even the current struggles that we're go they're going through. You know, as believers, we still continue to, to wrestle with our sin. We have been saved by grace, but that process of sanctification, it's a process, and we still struggle at times. And we have to be careful that we don't identify a person by their sin, thinking, well, how are they a member of this church? It's easy to do, but folks, we have to remember that all of us have sinned. We have all made mistakes. But thank God for His grace. And the change that he has made in us. He has given us a new heart. We are made into a new creation. And he is still continuing to work in us. We must remember that Jesus can take the worst of sinners. Paul calls himself the chief of all sinners. And he can make them and mold them into faithful believers. He can take useless sinners like you, like me, and make us useful. Just as Isaiah 64, 8 says, he is the potter, we are the clay. And as his people, he takes us, however useless we might be, and he molds us. He sanctifies us. He changes us more and more to be like him each day. Think about all that he has done with you. In all of your brokenness, in all of your failings, in all of your sin, He has changed your heart and is working in you. And He is able to do that with anyone. Right now you might be thinking, well, how can the world, can He work in me? I've done so much wrong. But folks, He can change the hardest of hearts. He can forgive the largest of failings. Gave Onesimus. He changed Onesimus. And Paul wants to show Philemon that because Jesus has changed this slave, we 
we need to see that strange too. Think about those that you go to church with. Those that you sit in the pews across from. Who are you holding their past against them? Who are you judging? Maybe you don't even realize it. And I encourage you to stop. Because the truth, as we see here, is as the church Christ, he has changed our hearts. And so may we start seeing each other through the eyes of Jesus. Instead of looking down upon one another, instead of holding grudges for past mistakes, instead of snubbing one another, May we be reminded and rejoice in the fact that the one who has changed our hearts is able to take a useless adulterer, a useless addict, a useless alcoholic, a useless sinner, or even a useless slave, and make them useful in his church. And may we receive those people, those sinners, just as he has received us. Because whether we like it or not, the second thing we see is that Christ connects the church. He takes people from all over, from different stages in life, from different cities, from different cultures, from different races, and he connects them all together through himself. No matter if we like it or not, there are going to be people in the body of Christ that are different from you. And that's okay. We see Paul explaining that here in this passage as he how he connects us. For before, Philemon viewed Onesimus only as his slave. And as a bond servant, as Paul calls him here. But now, because Onesimus has come to Christ, he and Philemon are, are now connected. Not only, as Paul says in verse 16 in the flesh, they're not only connected as slave and master in that relationship anymore, but now they are connected so much more in that they are brothers in the Lord. They are now on equal ground before Christ. Yes, Philemon was the master and Onesimus was the slave, but through Christ they have been connected together in the family of God, both as undeserving sinners who have been shown God's grace. You know, we, we so often look at one another through the eyes of society in the sense of the different tiers uh, that people are in, where you have like a CEO at the top and at the bottom you have an associate. Or you've got the superintendent of the school district and you've got the principal, the assistant principal, and then the teacher. Or even maybe in your job, maybe there's a, a certain hierarchy that you can think about, some sort of tier system of importance. Well, the higher you are, the better you are. You know, we can even think about that in, in government. Um, there's a story about uh, President Rutherford B. Hayes and his wife, Lucy, that the Sunday after his inauguration, um, they were leaving the church and Many of the congregation, they were coming up to the president and his wife saying hello. Uh, and one of Lucy's friends had said to her, you know, it, wouldn't it be better if there was an unwritten rule that when the service was over, the, the presidential party left while everybody else stayed in their place. That way they weren't bothered by the rest of the people. It was interesting that Lucy looked to her and she ended up saying, no, dear. Don't need that. Because here we're all on one level. You know, it's so easy to think that we are better than others, even others in the church. Be honest with yourself. Is your pride, is your station in life making you think that you're better than others? Because you have more money in your bank account, because you have more experience. That's something because you may have even been in the church longer that you're better than others. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you think that you are so lowly and useless that you have nothing to offer. That your state, because of your station in life, you are less 
than those around me. But folks, what Paul is showing us here is that while we do have earthly relationships that stay the same, when we come to Jesus, when we believe the gospel, it levels us out. That's why the gospel is called the great leveler. When we come to faith, Jesus connects us together by taking those that are way up high and bringing them down, and those that are way down low and bringing them up. That we are all on the same playing field together as Christians, as sinners who have been saved by grace, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Folks, the church is where young and old, black and white, master and slave, even Democrat and Republican, are brought together as the family of God by his love and connecting us together so that the same love will be shown to one another. This is the love that Paul is showing Philemon here. Now, one thing we do need to mention quickly is that Paul does call himself father. And Paul is not saying that he's better than others. But if we look at how the church, God has set up the church, he has indeed set elders and pastors and those to lead, to guide, to teach the church um, with authority, to care for the church. But they're to do that out of love. But Paul also calls himself a brother to show all of us that he, that other pastors, that all elders, although that God might have appointed them to help guide and to lead the church, that they are in need of grace just as much as everybody else. They are fellow brothers in Christ. And so he doesn't force Philemon to accept Onesimus, but he reminds him of the love that we are to have for one another as brothers and sisters in Jesus. Onesimus, as Paul says, was his very heart. Paul loved Onesimus as a brother in Christ. And he points out here that he is also Philemon's brother. Yes, he has done wrong. Yes, he has messed up. But he is to be Philemon's beloved brother. Not just a brother, but a beloved one. And again, this is a reminder to all of us that we have been connected through Christ. And because of that, we are to love one another just as Christ has loved us. Are you loving your brothers and sisters in Christ as you should? Again, not just the ones that you get along with, but all of them. If you aren't, how can you better show it? How can you better show them the same love that Jesus has shown to you? May we not hold out on one another, but instead show forth that love of Christ to each and every Christian. No matter how different that they are. Because Jesus has shown them the same grace he has showed you. As he has connected us all together in his church. In his family. He has brought all of us together. And although we might think that somebody is different. Jesus had a plan for them just like he had a plan for you. And he has worked out his plan to bring them into the church as he has worked out his plan to bring you into the church. And that leads us to our final point. As we look at other believers, we see that Christ controls all things in order to bring his church together. By his sovereignty, by his providence, God ensures that his church will indeed come to him. As I've said before, God always gets his man. They will come to faith. And I understand that when we hear the word control or providence or election, these things make us a little uncomfortable. But as we've mentioned within the past few weeks, that it's actually a blessing for us. A blessing that the Lord ensures that all that happens in his people's life will bring them to faith. 
He has done that in our lives. If you're watching and you've come to Christ, He has done that with you. He's done that with Onesimus, as you see here. Look at verse 15. Paul draws this out for us. There he says, For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. You know, Paul is saying, All that has, has happened was for a reason. You know, Philemon was probably wondering why in the world would Onesimus steal from him and run away. He had been good to him. You know, from what we know of his character, Philemon, he probably treated his slaves well. And he's wondering, well, why in the world would this slave steal and run away? And why in the world is he going to come back? Well, Paul explains right here that it was part of God's plan. Onesimus would run away, but when he did run away, he would find Jesus. And that he would return not only to his master as a slave, but he would return as a fellow brother in the gospel. And if you stop and you actually pay attention to this story, it's quite clear you can see God at work. You know, Onesimus would have been a needle in a haystack in Rome. So many people there, and then Paul would have been another needle in the haystack. But yet you see that they still run into one another. And from that encounter, although we don't have the details, we see that Onesimus came to Jesus. And this man, who probably would have never returned home otherwise, is now coming back to Philemon because of all that has happened. Something that Philemon probably thought was not possible. But yet, folks, this, this is no coincidence. When you see how God works, you understand that there is no uh, chance, there is no probability. It's our God who controls all things, who holds things together, who puts things in motion according to his plan. That will never fail. You see the hand of God at work as he brings Onesimus into his church. And you see the hand of God at work and how he brings the rest of us into it as well. He did it with me and he did it with you. you know, if you think about the course of events he used in your life to bring you to faith, you can see that. You know, you, you could have an amazing testimony. There are many people out there that have been at rock bottom into drugs and, and all sorts of, of, of problems, hating God, but yet you see by God and His grace how He picked them up and brought them into His family. And that's wonderful. I mean, you see with Onesimus that you have a crazy story like that. But also, there's just as much of an amazing testimony if God has worked in your life by raising you in the church. Coming to church every Sunday morning, coming to faith in Jesus, it's not boring, it's not less than, because the truth of the matter is, whichever way you look at it, it's a miracle, it's wonderful, it's amazing that Jesus works in each one of our lives, controlling all things that, so that whoever we might be, wherever we might come from, if we are his people, he will bring us into his family. It may be an amazing you know, turnaround story, and it may be an amazing you grew up in church story. But we see our God at work in the life of each and every one of his people that he brings into his family. And right now he might be using this sermon to bring you into his family. He might be calling you to look to him as the Lord and Savior. I pray that he is. For all of this, as Jesus is in control, it reminds us that we, we can be thankful. For we have a God who guides all of our steps to him. And we can also not only be thankful for how God has guided us into his church, but how God has guided one another into his church as well. All of those people in your church, God is behind them. He is the one behind bringing them into the fold. He is the one that's bringing those people that are watching this sermon. He is the one that's bringing those people that sit in the pews across from you. He is the one that's bringing those fellow workers in the gospel into this family. Those that are here now and those that he will bring in the future. 
Folks, this gives us hope beyond all hope. Because there are times that we, really, we don't know what God is doing, but we can trust that all things are working together for our good. As you've been hopefully watching the, the Joseph Bible study we've been doing, we see that in the life of Joseph. How God has been using him and his life to bring about good for his people. And this reminds us that he, he, uses, he can use hardship. He can use difficulty to bring us to him. He can use pain and struggling for someone that we love to finally come to faith. And although we might not know exactly what he is doing, we can know that he is indeed working. And so we can find hope in that. As we see here in the life of Onesimus, God is working the whole time. And there are people in our lives that we are probably worried about. Those that have gone off the deep end. Those that have turned their back on the church that have forsaken God, but yet we can be encouraged that God will work in the lives of his people. Maybe he will use the pain in your life, in their life, to bring you or them to Christ. Maybe he will use a hard circumstance or bad decisions to bring a loved one to faith. And if we stop and think about all the, the difficult circumstances we have put ourselves in, we can find hope that our God has redeemed us from them. And so the same can be true with others. It's easy to get discouraged. But this passage again reminds us that just as God has worked in the life of Onesimus to bring this man to faith. We can find hope that he can do that with us and he can do that with others. No matter how hopeless the situation might seem. You know, Philemon thought that Onesimus was gone. But Christ had a plan to bring him back. And he has a plan for his church, for each and every one of his people. So may we be encouraged that although we might not see what Jesus is doing... May we love and appreciate that we can know, though we don't see it, that he is working all things for the good of us as his church. For me, for you, and for all of his other people in the pews. And so because of all this, as you see Jesus working in the life, in your life, in the life of fellow believers... May we have a love for them because of him. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we're sinners. But if we have believed in Jesus, then we are sinners saved by grace. And so may we cherish each other. Not just as people that we sit in a sanctuary with once a week. Not just the general niceties that we say to one another. But may we cherish each other and love one another as those whose hearts Christ has changed to those whom we have been connected. And it's those that he has controlled, bringing us all together in faith. If you have believed in Jesus, then you are part of the church. And he's done it for a reason. He's brought me into the church. He's brought you into the church. He's brought that person, that person into the church. And so may we look through the lens of Christ instead of looking down upon one another. But may we see each other as beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. May we seek to love and to care for one another. May we support each other in our Christian walk. Not because of our station in life. Not because of what they might give you in return. But because we have all been brought into the family of Jesus. As he does here with a slave and a master. Reconciling them to one another. May he reconcile us to himself and to one another as well. And may he use us to play a part in the lives of lost, runaway sinners. That as Paul played a part in the life of Onesimus. He would use us 
to help others come to faith in Jesus. So that they, and may we welcome them into our church home. For this is their home too. For if Jesus has worked in our homes, in our lives, then we are all beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. May we love and cherish our relationships. May we care for one another. And may we do it all for the love of the one who has brought us all together. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, that you have taken each and every one of your members of your church from different walks of life and brought them together into your family. As brothers and sisters, to love, to cherish each other. Lord, may we be built up as the church. May we love one another as you have loved us. May we receive one another, no matter the background, no matter the mistakes. But Lord, may we love each other and care for one another as you have done with us. Lord, may you use each and every one of us, whatever our station is in life, for your gospel. As you have made us all equals as partners with you in the gospel, Lord, may you help us to share that love with others, Christian brothers and sisters and, and unbelievers, that they would come to know the love of Jesus. Lord, we pray for those in our lives that have wandered far off. May it be part of your plan to bring them back. And Lord, may you use us to play a part in it. Lord, we thank you that we can be called your church. We thank you that we can be called, be called brothers and sisters in Christ. And we love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you would pause the video, sing one more song together as a family, and then resume it for the benediction. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. And amen. Again, miss you. Look forward to seeing you. If there's anything you need, please let us know.